Welcome to the last lecture of this AMP Anatomy and Physiology 2. This, in this chapter we're going to cover from fertilization to death and dying. Much of the information that you will see is, is information that we've had from the early chapters um, in genetics and then through the male and female reproductive systems as well as well as other chapters with the organ systems and understanding how aging affects each of the organ systems. So senescence is this idea of a natural aging type of process and what we expect to happen during that process. So fertilization was that event of when a sperm will meet an egg. So one sperm, this is showing you one sperm and how it is um, just through this acrosome, the end of the sperm, the, of the head of the sperm is got digestive enzymes is breaking through the zone, the outer heart, or heart zone shell of an egg and how it ends up breaking through and then being accepted into the egg. Only one, so this is representing one sperm, only one sperm is allowed for, to, for that to happen and then as soon as that one sperm enters the egg will um, wall off and no other sperm would be allowed to enter at that point. So that event is actually called fertilization. You can see some of the challenges the sperm would have to go through and then you can also see how the female physiology actually um, assist in this process. So um, the sperm are fertile for about 48 hours after ejaculation. I know um, some people mistakenly think that that idea of fertilization happens during, you know, intercourse and during, you know, orgasm and whatever. It doesn't. It's, le it's many hours later because the sperm have a long, long way to travel. So um, we understand that. We also understand that for meiosis, this is that special cell division. Again, just, this is just a, a repeat of this, but meiosis is the second cell division, type of cell division that is only occurring in the gonads and is getting us our gametes, sperm and eggs. So the fertilized egg, once the sperm meets the egg, is called a zygote. Again, this is sort of repeat for you. We also know that early on, the first couple of weeks, this newly dividing group of cells that, that are in a fluid-filled sac called a cyst, it's actually referred to as a blastocyst. So the blastocyst reaches, once fertilization happens and the zygote is formed and the cells start to divide, the blastocyst takes about six days roughly to get to back to the uterus through the fallopian tube and it implants into the endometrium of the the uterus. So this is happening again around the sixth day. When we think about twins and how they happen, um, dizygotic twins is referring to two eggs that have been fertilized by two different sperm. So dizygotic. They're no more similar to any other siblings so that have the same father, same mother. Now, is it possible if there was a sperm pool, a mixture from two fathers, that there could is it possible that um, someone could have twins with different fathers because two different sperm? Yes, that's possible. It's happened. It's happened. It's been really, really rare, but it actually has because twins, natural twins are rare. Uh, it's rare for a woman to have two eggs that have formed in a one monthly cycle. It's usually just one follicle that is going to be targeted and one egg that will be made. But sometimes um, that can happen. Monozygotic is what we refer to as identical twins. So this is uh, one single egg, one single sperm, and early on in that blastocyst stage, the entire group of cells um, separate and then they start dividing on their own. So this is a kind of a, the idea of identical twins is siblings is sort of controversial because yes, do they have the same DNA fingerprint? Yes, they do. But each of them, even from early on, even in utero, are having different environmental types of pressures. So while the identical twins have the same DNA fingerprint, when they look at the DNA, they do not have the same actual fingerprints. Their, their 
fingerprints are actually different. Again, because of environmental pressures, the difference in environmental pressures. So when implantation happens, this blastocyst actually hits this very cultivated endometrium that's at its thickest in that late uh, luteal phase around the 21st day, and it attaches to that, sending down these little tentacles, these cells, little tentacles, that will be where actually the placenta will form. I have talked about an ectopic pregnancy, and this means a pregnancy outside of the endometrium outside of the uterus so oftentimes it is actually in the the tubule so and we understand that again this before modern medicine and it is an emergency event would have meant death to the to the uh, female now um, it is on really rare I can't even tell you the numbers I've never personally seen this in the 15 years I was in clinical medicine but it is actually uh, it is really, really rare, but sometimes abdominal pregnancies can happen. Certainly, if that does happen, there would be no exit route. There's no way out for that fetus. So obviously, it would require a cesarean section. But again, a very high-risk pregnancy and very, very rare. So the embryonic stage is from two, three weeks to nine weeks. Again, we have gone over that. And this is during the time, this is when the germ layers will be forming that end up becoming all of the different organ systems. The ecto, meso, and endodermal layers are forming and differentiation is actually occurring. When we look early on, um, early on we can see that the placenta and embryonic membranes are starting to develop around four to five weeks. Very early on, there's some testing that can be, be done called chorionic villi sampling, CVS testing. This is when they, are, they will take a needle through the cerv use, using a speculum opening the vagina. They can go in through the cervical opening with a, a needle, just through the cervical opening to express some cells from this chorionic sampling uh, as early as eight, eight to nine weeks. And from those cells, which will include some of the embryonic cells, they can do karyotyping to diagnose some chromosomal anomalies. So amniocentesis is usually done after the 14th week, and that's coming from the abdomen, through the abdomen, through the uterus, into the amniotic sac, getting some amniotic fluid. So the, um, the benefit of doing CVS, chorionic villi sampling, over the amniocentesis would be that you can do it much, much earlier and have those results much, much earlier to, um, to figure out if you want to make a decision about continuing the, the pregnancy at that point. Uh, because sometimes um, these chromosomal anomalies are going to be devastating for the organism. But anyway, so that's the difference in that. Pre-embryonic pre sampling can be done when, when pregnancies are happening from in vitro. So in vitro means test tube. So fertilization happened in the test tube. Everything is happening in the, te in the petri dish test tube. And the newly dividing group of cells can be tested at that point too before they're I I've ever implanted. So that those are different ways that uh, chromosomal testing, karyotyping can be done early, early on. Again, the placenta is going to, after about the 12th week, is going to take over secreting the hormones that are necessary to sustain the pregnancy. Again, we've mentioned this. And the placenta is going to need to be not blocking the the internal os here. So this internal os of the cervix is going to be where the fetus is going to have to move through the birth canal. Nothing can be blocking that. The amniotic sac breaks, that's the water breaking, and the fetus is ready to move through. If the placenta is in front, that's called placenta previa. So um, some of these, some of these slides I'm just going to move through. We've talked about um, 
you know, the, some of the development. I don't really ask you about these different days and what is happening. Typically, the heart is starting to beat around the eighth week or right before the eighth week. Uh, most organs are actually in place. It doesn't mean that they're functioning, but they are actually in place around that time. And um, you, you know, you could go through some of these just so that you can see the earliest viable the one that survived viable surviving fetus has been at tw around 21 weeks at 21 weeks it's less than a pound and it can fit in like the palm of my hand my hand so very very small um and then it's going to require months maybe even longer you know more than a year of intensive neonatal care um, as the rest of the development happens full term is considered 40 weeks not before 40 weeks so there is this 32 week period where people um, tend to really want to get this development at least into the 32 weeks and the reason for that is because of those great alveolar cells that we said secrete surfactant that seems to be the number of the week that we tend to see better outcomes as far as respiratory distress of the newborn is if they're over 32 weeks so we really try hard to get at least that but every day in utero is a good day for the fetus because they are building um, you know the reserves that they're going to need to survive not only the birth but shortly after the birth as well you know we think about the trauma maybe the mother is going through during birth but the fetus and neonate is also um, experiencing quite a bit of trauma at the time typically we want after birth that the birth weight doesn't go down by 10 percent if it does then that then that um, neonate is at risk but it's not uncommon for um, the birth weight to drop a little bit right after delivery because as, as I said this is also a traumatic event for the neonate if but we don't want to see it drop that much and some some don't drop at all so that last couple three weeks the fetus is actually just building fat reserves that is going to get them, them through that event now many most in developed countries most physicians will not allow you to go past 42 weeks 42 weeks after that again the numbers tell us that, that there's no good outcome happening but up to 42 weeks they're going to want you to sit tight um, so this is just you know giving you an idea here again the neonate is up to um, six weeks after this this delivery and again feeding needs to happen at least three to four hours i've known a lot of new parents who feel like oh they're one week old two week old or sleeping through the night not really they're sleeping through the night their infant needs to be wake, woken up and needs to eat because of glucose homeostasis and so many other things that are going on um, with that neonate they can't thermoregulate they're not their livers are immature they cannot keep their glucose at where it needs to be so so no <laughs> they, it's the parents that are sleeping through the night the the infants need to be woken up um anyway so again just good information needs to be given to, especially to new parents about this type of thing i talked about breast milk and how important it would maybe be even if somebody doesn't breastfeed that maybe they could pump the first milk the colostrum that is going to be so rich in um, those antibodies from the mother to help to coat the the neonates gi tract all right i not going to ask too many questions or any questions about the embryonic development really um, but infants really do have a larger ratio of surface to area of volume so they lose heat incredibly quickly again this is good information to give to new parents because sometimes parents think that their baby only has to be uh, clothed the way they are clothed depending on the atmosphere or the environment but that's not really true a baby can't thermoregulate it's not going to be able to sweat it's not going to be able to chill it's not going to be able to do that so it's going to be very important that they understand that um, the kidneys are not fully developed at birth as either so again much higher risk of dehydration um, and a higher rate of water loss 
feeding every three to four hours if it's a full-term baby. More than that if it's not a full-term baby. This is, or again, a reason that you don't let an infant sleep. Uh, it means their bodies aren't responding, but they internally they're really needing it. Premature infants used to be considered by a certain week of gestation, but now it's more they more look at weight or they look at a combination of factors. But weighing under 5.5 pounds is considered to be um, a preemie. So again, with some of the things that we worry about is that there's not enough surfactant and respiratory distress will be a problem. Thermoregulation, the digestive system isn't functioning so and the liver is not functioning. So um, all of these things are going to be things that are um, to be considered in a premature. Then there's some congenital meaning at birth. Congenital means at birth. Anomalies that can happen and they can happen because of infectious diseases that actually can some, some of them can cross the placenta. So we know HIV, uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus, measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, herpes simplex, these can all affect um, the neonate and as far as it, congenital infections that can lead to nervous system um, devastation, really, blind, blindness, cerebral palsy, physical and mental um, retardation, and those are just some of the results and certainly can even, even have mortality rates associated with them. Teratogens are anything, anything that can lead to fetal harm. So that's what the word teratogen means, anything that could harm a fetus. So some viruses, some chemicals, some drugs that the mother may be taking or exposed to, alcohol, smoking. Smoking is a teratogen, the, the mother smoking. So fetal alcohol syndrome we know is something that will be everlasting um, that a infant would put up with. I don't think any of you all will ever deal with thalidomide, um, but thalidomide was something that was stopped many decades ago. It was something that was given for mothers who had had serious nausea in their pregnancies. And they were given this because it could help the nausea, but then they were having um, neonates that were missing appendages. So they had, they called them flipper appendages. They were being born with just little partial, um, they, I didn't call them flippers. That's what they were actually referred to. Um, either one, two, or sometimes all four. Um, so these are just teratogens, anything that cause it, that can potentially cause harm. Oh, by the way, over-the-counter medications are also on this list of teratogens. When someone has good prenatal care, they will be given a list of what is considered to be safer things that they could take in case they have a cold or they have allergies or they have whatever, you know, during the pregnancy. But, but honestly, there is no such thing as a completely safe drug to take while you are pregnant. Now, there are some safer ones than others, but always that should be, um, you know, considered with, you know, before taking anything when you're pregnant. And certainly there is no safe amount of alcohol. Even one alcohol drink could lead to fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and again, smoking is smoking and alcohol are probably the two most that are abused, uh, and or um, and or marijuana. And it's the legal drugs. The legal drugs are the drugs that are the most used. The over the counter, the you know over the counter, the recreational drugs and the prescribed drugs. Those are the drugs that are the most commonly used and misused. And again, even though some of them we know to be fairly safe and the proper dosing. Um, there's some that are not, you know, so. And now I would like to just briefly, because we're almost at the end of this, but I would really like to briefly tell you about some chromosomal anomalies that can happen during meiosis. We remember that meiosis is going to take the number of chromosomes down by half. So instead of 46 total as that first cell, the germ cell, it's called a germ cell, uh, starts off with, after two divisions, there will be four cells that have half the number of chromosomes, 23 each. 
Okay, so sometimes during that meiosis, problems can arise. So when we think about disjunction and non-disjunction, these are, these are some of the problems that are the more common ones that can actually arise. So during a um, normal disjunction, we're going to end up having, as we said, we're going to end up having a normal female, this is the 23rd pair, XX, normal male, X and Y, and it's the 23rd pair that we see problems in with non-disjunction. That's what, what we um, can actually see most often with non-disjunction. So when this happens and meiosis is occurring and like the, the mother, when this is happening, this can give you a triple X situation. So instead of 46 total chromosomes for the offspring, now this, off, this individual, this neonate, has 47 chromosomes. If this egg were to be fertilized with the X sperm, this has 45 chromosomes instead of 46. This is called Turner syndrome. I have had two friends that had Turner syndrome. I've also had a student recently in the class, in the seated class, who shared with the class that she had Turner syndrome. In Turner syndrome, the individual will, if the individual survives, some of these are actually spontaneously aborted. A spontaneous abortion is what the, is what the general public calls a miscarriage. In medicine, that's called a spontaneous abortion. So uh, we do know that many of these non-disjunctions uh, actually are going to end in spontaneous abortions. How we know that is that the people, when they're miscarrying, go to medical facilities. And if that miscarriage happens at a medical facility, by law, they have to test the the tissues from the miscarriage. And so we do know that sometimes that's what causes the miscarriage is that there was this non-disjunction. But if a Turner syndrome survives that, this is going to be a female that will have 45 chromosomes. She will develop, um, you know, intellectually normal, intellectually no, no problem, but physically will not develop secondary uh, sexual characteristics and will be sterile. So will not have the normal development at puberty that we think of. So typically we think of these women as being somewhat usually shorter. Um, they are not going, their gonads are not going to develop. Sometimes, not always, only one of the few that I know had, they have webbing at the neck. So the neck is much, um, there is a, a, some physical anomalies happening with the neck and external, um, sort of have androgynous kind of body shape, almost like a young boy, really. Um, it's not going to develop secondary female characteristics. The triple X is actually going to be an infertile female with mental impairment. So again, the triple X is going to be a female with 47 chromosomes. Turner is going to be a female with 45 chromosomes. And sometimes there is a condition when the Y sperm eats that egg that had non-disjunction. This is going to be a male that is going to be sterile of normal intelligence but underdeveloped testes, so they are sterile. Sometimes these males will come in because they are with a partner and um, they're having fertility issues and they didn't know they had Klinefelter syndrome until the chromosomal karyotyping was done. And it was shown that they have 47 chromosomes. So they have 47 chromosomes because instead of just two in that 23rd pair, they have three. Okay. The only autosomal non-disjunction that is really, really viable, okay, really viable, is at the 21st site, the 21st pair. This is the only one that ends up being viable, making it, you know, as a neonate and surviving. And this is called, because it's three instead of just two at that pair, it's three, this is called trisomy 21. And in layman, you know, layman people call it Down syndrome. So I think most people know about Down syndrome. It's fairly, you know, it's not that uncommon. And again, it's the only non-disjunction of that first through the 22nd pair that we really consider to be viable. 
um, there are some characteristics that even if during gestation, during pregnancy, no karyotyping was done, so no, no pre-implantation, no CVS testing, no amniocentesis was done, so this neonate was born, there's, there's physical characteristics that are uh, pretty telling that there is a chromosomal anomaly here, non-disjunction called tr trisomy 21 that we call Downs. An epicanthal fold is seen. Also, there is this single palmar simian uh, crease that this is referred to as sometimes the fingers are, you know, shown to be, you know, having this, this curved little finger. There, there are other things that they look at too. The tongue, they look at proportions of the limbs. Um, they do these ratio studies of that. And then this is typically going to show some mental impairment, um, as, as, I think probably we all know people with Down syndrome. So aging, these were these last few things I just talked about, Turner, Triple X, Kleinfelter. Make sure you do know the characteristics of those. So you make sure you absolutely do know those. Those were these first ones are the sex chromosomes, the 23rd pair, the one that we talk about with the autosomes, first through the 22nd pair, really the one that's the most viable is, uh, because most aren't viable, they're going to spontaneously abort, is going to be Down syndrome. Okay, and just make sure you understand what's happening to the chromosome number and some of the basic characteristics. Aging and senescence. So we know that aging is a natural process. Uh, we know that there's some things that we can do to sort of um, you know, ward off some of the things that are happening to our organ systems and us as we age. Certainly eating right, go figure, eating right, sleeping well, um, yeah, exercise, and all of those things combined, are, you know, reducing anxiety, you know, doing all those things, staying in safe environments can help to prolong your life, but also help to um, keep these organ systems from aging at the rate that they could. So when we think about senescence this this and how this is all of this is occurring the leading cause of death for young adults is going to be accidents it's not going to be their it's not going to be their physiology their anatomy and physiology it's going to be accidents homicides suicides and then aids aids is, is still one of the leading and it's an infectious disease from a virus it's still um, considered to be a pandemic around the world and um, a leading one of the leading causes of death. Now people who get treated for HIV positive status can actually prevent themselves from going into full-blown AIDS and can live with that virus now relatively normal lifespans. But it takes being diagnosed and it takes early, early diagnosis, and it takes a um, committed treatment plan, a committed treatment plan. So that's the good news about that. Leading causes of death after 55 is senescence. So just a normal things that you expect, uh, heart disease, some metabolic disorders like diabetes, strokes, cancer, those types of things. Middle, to eight, middle age is considered, you know, 40 to 59. I'm not going to ask you that. And old age, 60 and older. So senior citizens at this age. Um, that all organ systems do not de degenerate at the same time. So it just completely depends on the lifestyle, really. So exercising, we do know absolutely can extend someone's life. Good exercise, good nutrition, good sleep, all of these uh, health practices we absolutely understand can do that. Um, there are a lot of different theories and mechanisms for aging. We know that at the end of our chromosomes, there are these telomere regions. So every time cells divide and whatever, the telomeres become shorter. It has just recently been, dis and, and as they shorten to a certain point, they won't divide anymore. So there, just recently, the, the location of the genes that control that has been discovered. So is that going to be the fountain of youth that has been discovered, that we can somehow manipulate our the process of how our genes divide and keep them going indefinitely. You know, I don't know, science is, is certainly reaching a lot of um, milestones that are exciting and um, whatnot, but we haven't gotten there yet. So no fountain of youth yet 
and we do understand that um, you know aging is just a natural process free radicals we said are going to actually destroy some of the molecules in our cells that we need for cell function and they're naturally produced by just metabolism but we can also overexpose ourselves to them like we can overexpose ourselves to radiation we can overexpose ourselves to food preservatives that that um, cause free radicals we or and or drugs or poisons or whatnot in our environment so staying away from those would be um, a good thing and can help with longevity so um, you know there there are a lot of things that we've talked about in each of the organ systems in the nervous system we talked about Alzheimer's we talked about cardiovascular disease and you know the different types of cancer that actually happens so we understand that that's um, part of of an aging kind of process we think about the life expectancy this is a cup this is actually a couple of years old now when we're thinking about in developed countries uh, boys and girls and each developed country has their own sort of life expectancies for males and females but it's it's this is a couple of years old now and I think the between the female and the male it's become closer so uh, it used to be that females had a much significantly longer age but now it's closer to each other and it's around 74 so with the pandemic that we're experiencing right now that those uh, expectancies have changed and again it's a numbers kind of game but we expect it with that many deaths there have been seven um, you know, million deaths that have that have been documented which means there's a lot more than that uh, from this pandemic uh, 700,000 just the United States so this those numbers will play a role in affecting the life expectancy so what we know too is that when we think about death the sometimes you all have seen maybe you've even been experiencing this in your um, in your work I know I have CNAs and LPNs and even RNs that take this class and if you are working with a patient and the time of death is called on that patient you understand that not all the cells die at the same time and it can be a um, you know this is a number that this is a time that's usually called when it is thought that the per person is not going to be able to be resuscitated um, card with cardiovascular respiratory function so that time of death gets called and you know it doesn't mean that all the cells at the same time have, have are going to die though so if somebody is on life support they usually are going to see about the brain wave activity and clinical death is determined for 24 hours after there is no brain wave activity so all the organs might be fine and might be functioning and are kept can be kept going but if there is no brain wave activity uh, at that time then a time of death would be called so, so this ends our, our anatomy and physiology course. Congratulations. I'm excited for you. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, good luck with all of the, with the exam that's about to come up. The exam will include, in this section for AMP2, will include anything about any hormone related, anything about a hormone, where it's from, where it targets, if the target is specific, how it functions once it gets there, and diseases associated with each of the endocrine organ systems. And then also the rest of the chapters um, following the endocrine system, the deeper insights and the disorders tables. Stay well.